In the spring of 1932, an army of the poor and unemployed posed a new threat to Hoover's presidency. Veterans of the First World War, these men would build a movement that would shake the faith of many Americans in their government. The campaign began when ex-Army Sergeant Walter Waters led 300 veterans out of Portland, Oregon. Their goal? To claim a bonus for their military service. Congress had promised to pay the bonus in 1945, but the veterans wanted their money now. Other veterans, hearing of the bonus army, also began moving toward the capital. If there was a bonus army going to Washington, D.C., my dad wouldn't miss it for the world. He was very um, anti uh, the Hoover administration and the trickle-down economy of that particular era. We would drive to the outskirts of uh, town, and then we would march through the town with our signs and so forth. And um, uh, my brother and I and several other children, we held the large American flag in our hands, open, spread out like a spread. And the townspeople threw nickels and dimes uh, into the flag. And um, that was the funding for food and gasoline. Uh, my uncle, uh, Sam, uh, was the uh, first in our family to ever uh, go east to the nation's capital because he felt compelled to uh, see that the bonus was paid off. We went down there with carloads of trucks coming from all over the country. Guys with no shoes on, ragged down clothes. I remember one family who had come all the way from California. Their home was taken away from them, and they had put into the car everything they could carry, including the jelly the wife had put up. And they used the jelly to um, uh, pay the toll charges. Once in khaki suits, she we looked swell, full of that Yankee doodle down. Half a million boots went slogging through hell, and I was a kid with a drum. The president and many in Congress attempted to discourage the bonus movement, but the veterans kept coming. Say, don't you remember? I'm your pal, buddy. Can you spare a dime? Unlike other protesters who marched on Washington and went home, the veterans planned to stay until a new bonus bill became law. A few blocks from the Capitol, along Pennsylvania Avenue, the veterans took over a group of abandoned buildings. And they set up housekeeping in the floors without any walls. Uh, and of course, that made a somewhat unsightly appearance. As the veterans outgrew the camps near the Capitol, the Washington police sent them outside the city to the mud flats along the Anacostia River. In case of riot, the police knew they could close the bridge to Anacostia and keep the veterans out of downtown Washington. With more veterans arriving every day, Secretary of War Patrick Hurley and Army Chief of Staff General Douglas MacArthur ordered tanks to move closer to the city. At the White House, the Secret Service requested that troops be prepared to defend the president at a moment's notice. The president had suggested that why not send army kitchens over and feed them. Well, the cabinet, and especially the, the Hurley of the War Department, said that would be accommodating him, and we would just get more and more and more and more. And of course, that went around the table. Hoover authorized delivery of medical supplies and surplus army equipment to the bonus camps, though he allowed no publicity about this aid. I remember moving into the tent city, and, um, and then we had a large tent that was ours, and we had army cots in the tent to sleep on, and we had army blankets. Uh, I don't know where they got all of these provisions from. There were field kitchens where they cooked for the men who were by themselves. Of course, my mother cooked for us, and uh, be a lot of soup, I know, because she had a lot of mouths to feed, so there, there was plenty of soup. At the end of May, Walter Waters officially took command of the Bonus Army in Washington. Keeping order in the camps, whose residents now numbered more than 3,000, 
was the responsibility of the city police force. I went on the police department at a salary of $1,900 a year. And in two months after on the police department, they cut us 10%. But I was drawing a check every two weeks, and there was millions of people in the United States that was not drawing that. I was happy. I was ecstatic. I could pay for my clothes. I could buy my motorcycle shoes that I had to buy. Uh, other people couldn't do this. But with these people that made these marchers, it was terrific. In early June, communist organizers around the country announced that the bonus march had been their idea. Although there were never more than 200 communists in the Bonus Army, their presence in Washington worried many in the government. The veterans are badly advised and badly led in marching upon Washington to collect a debt which is not due at this time and which the Congress does not propose to be coerced by any groups, veteran or any other, into voting a bonus bill in the present session of Congress. The bonus would cost more than the government would take in that year. Committed to a balanced budget, Hoover asked the Senate to save the country from what he called the road to ruin. In your hands at this moment is the answer to the question whether democracy has the capacity to speedily enough to act speedily enough to save itself in emergency. We're asking for the payment of a just and honest debt. It will be a godsend to this nation because the nation needs the additional purchasing power which this bill will afford. The bonus bill faced stiff opposition. Some feared it would divert money from more urgent depression measures. But the veterans lobbied hard. On June 15th, they moved one step closer to victory when the House of Representatives passed the bonus bill. Let's have a three cheers for the bonus that we're going to get. I don't think Washington really understood what had happened in the country until you got the bonus marches coming there and lobbying the Congress every day and settling into uh, makeshift dwellings all around the Capitol. That was what brought the Depression home to government. Now the veterans turned out to push the bonus through the Senate. But just two days after the victory in the House, the Senate voted to kill the bill. The news stunned the crowd. I remember walking down that long flight of steps from the Senate building and seeing thousands of people milling about. I think there was probably a sense of great confusion. I come all the way from California or Arkansas to try to get the bonus awarded so I can feed my kids. And Senate hasn't done anything about it. What do we do now? Why was it that you came to Washington? Why well, to beat the undertaker, spend the money before the undertaker gets it. I came to Washington to get my bonus, and I'm going to wait for it till I get it if I have to wait till 1945. Senator Gore, my grandfather, didn't believe in giving anybody anything. So he was opposed to the bonus. I went with my grandfather from his house in Rock Creek Park. He had a big, long, black Packard car. And a driver called Davis, and I sat in the back of the car. And as we drove down Pennsylvania Avenue on both sides with the bonus army, as we approached the Senate side of the Capitol, they recognized Senator Gore, and they began to stone the car. And from that moment on, I knew that it could happen here, and that one day we might indeed have a revolution, and it would be rich against poor. The veterans were determined to force Congress to reconsider. Over the next few weeks, as the government watched with concern, the population of the camps increased to over 20,000. Anacostia became the nation's most famous Hooverville. I'm just a poor ex soldier that's broken down and blue. I fought out in the great world war for the old red, white, and blue. 
On assignment for the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, Roy Wilkins visited Anacostia and found black and white vets living side by side, although Washington and the U.S. military were still strictly segregated. There was a sort of a leveling process as these people got together, and there was a sense of solidarity and a sense of responsibility to give a good account of themselves. They tried to give little homey touches to the hovels they lived in. Uh, some of them were built of, of cardboard, some of um, tin sheeting, some of wood, um, and a number of them had planted little gardens. The Bonus Army had occupied Washington for more than two months. With Congress scheduled to adjourn, the veterans mounted a final protest. For more than three days, they marched in front of the Capitol in slow, shuffling relays of tired men. The Washington press called it a death march. The atmosphere around the Capitol building was very strange during the death march. There was a, a sense of, of sadness, of desperation. The thing we couldn't forget was that uh, the pavement was so hot and with these bare feet, it must have been a very painful thing. We were practically begging for our money. As the vigil wore on, official Washington began to feel under siege. We drove through Washington as fast as we could. We didn't, we didn't feel comfortable stopping at stop sign, especially along Pennsylvania Avenue. And I had to cross Pennsylvania Avenue to get into the White House. And we rolled up our windows and locked our doors. And, uh, well, it was a ragtag bunch of people. It was a mess there in Washington. And we weren't happy about it in one bit. Tradition called for the president to come to Capitol Hill and close Congress. As the Senate debated on its last day, Hoover's limousine waited. It was a dramatic moment on the one hand where the Congress with the power to make or break some of these people. There was a president who sat in his well-guarded White House. The streets were cut off, were taped off. All in favor say aye. Fearful for the president's safety, the Secret Service did not let Hoover come to the Capitol. A few minutes before midnight, Congress adjourned without reconsidering the bonus bill. Members of Congress left through underground tunnels to avoid the veterans waiting outside. Take it from me, this is the greatest demonstration of Americanism we've ever had. Pure Americanism. Willing to take this beating as you've taken it. Stand right steady. You keep every law. And why in the hell shouldn't you? Who in the hell yeah, has done all the bleeding for this country and for this law and, and this Constitution anyhow for two fellas? But don't, don't take a step back. Remember, as soon as you haul down your camp flag here and clear out this thing, every one of you clears out, this evaporates in thin air. And all this struggle will have been no good. Washington authorities wanted their city back. Twelve days after Congress adjourned, the district commissioners ordered police to evict the veterans from the buildings on Pennsylvania Avenue. One thousand angry veterans poured across the bridge from the main camp at Anacostia into downtown. We had no uh, uh, training, special training, to handle riots. Veterans refused to move. They got bricks and started throwing at the policemen. Several of the policemen were hurt, and some of the policemen picked up bricks and threw them back at the veterans. Then the police opened fire. One veteran was killed. Another lay dying. City commissioners now requested that the president call out the military. By four o'clock, army troops were in position behind the White House. I had a press card, and I used it to get through the police line, and uh, I saw advancing towards us some cavalry, some marching troops, a couple of not too formidable whippet tanks, 
And I suddenly realized that the uh, commander was the chief of staff of the United States at the time, General MacArthur, and that uh, assisting him were two majors, Major George Patton, and the other was Major Dwight D. Eisenhower. The uh, cavalry men pulled their sabers out of their scabbards. The, the troops fixed bayonets. I heard a bugle sound, and they all drew their sabers, and then another bugle sound, and they started, the whole line started forward at a walk. MacArthur's orders from Hoover were to surround the area on Pennsylvania Avenue and clear it without delay. In violation of those orders, MacArthur began to clear the entire city of the Bonus Army. Here were young fellows, of course a lot younger than most of the veterans, were charged with going out and, and actually using force against people that had fought for the United States in World War I. The men who had been under fire in Europe, and this was nothing new to them, kept the proper distance and when a canister of tear gas was thrown, part of the time they'd throw it back. It was a, a feeling of frustration. You wanted to help both of them. You know you couldn't do anything. It was something that uh, I'll never forget. I happened to be near General MacArthur. And I saw him speak to a sergeant, and then I saw the sergeant uh, collect a squad and then go down the row of, of uh, ramshackle huts, and they'd throw a wad of newspaper into a corner of a hut and set that alight, and they went right down the whole row that way, and pretty soon the whole row was burning. While MacArthur's troops mopped up downtown, Three of his tanks held the bridge leading to Anacostia. Trapped inside the camp with the veterans were 600 of their wives and children. My father was away in the tent and came back and uh, told my mother that they were, they were going to march on the capital. He was going to march in force. And, uh, of course, my mother was a little upset about it. When we started to cross the bridge and I uh, saw these soldiers, and I've never seen tanks and soldiers on horses and soldiers with bayonets before, and uh, so, uh, and my father was pretty headstrong. I didn't know whether he was going to try to go through them or not, but uh, it, uh, it was frightening. Yeah, I remember very well. It was uh, something I'll never forget. Twice that night, Hoover ordered MacArthur not to cross into Anacostia, but the general chose to ignore presidential authority. A few minutes after 11 p.m., he sent his troops across the bridge. By midnight, all of Washington could see Anacostia burning. What had gone on reinforced my feeling that it was too bad that the richest country in the world couldn't do a better job of caring for its own people. I just thought America didn't give a very good account of itself that night. While the ruins of Anacostia smoldered, bonus marchers filled the roads leaving the capital. As the men retreated, General MacArthur reported that the veterans had intended to take over the government. Although MacArthur had violated direct orders, President Hoover took full responsibility for the eviction of the Bonus Army. In Albany, New York, Franklin Roosevelt, the Democratic candidate for president, listened to radio reports of the rout and told his aide he thought Hoover had already lost the election. The next morning at the breakfast table, the president was very much upset. And he said uh, uh, to the cabinet, he says, uh, I, I, I know 
There's no way we can explain to the American people what happened yesterday. Why did we have to use so much force against unarmed veterans? He says, why did we have to do that? He says, I know the, the Democrats are laughing themselves to death. Roosevelt waged a strenuous campaign. Though his platform was vague, he suggested that his new deal for the American people would make government more responsive to the suffering caused by the Depression. President Hoover remained opposed to increased demands upon the federal government. What our people need is the restoration of their normal jobs, the recovery of agricultural prices, and the business. They need... A lot of people were out of work, and they weren't happy at all with the president. They blamed it all on him. And they took us after the speech was over and rushed us back to the train. It was ugly. It was ugly. They were screaming, and they were shaking their fists at us, and we were frightened. I know the Secret Service men were frightened, too, for the president. It was a very anxious time. As Hoover's campaign arrived in Iowa, more than 6,000 farms were in foreclosure. With Americans preparing to go to the polls, the head of the Farmers Union predicted, unless the president elected gives farmers relief, he will be the last president of the United States. These forces that I saw developing, coming from the heart of America, the unemployed, farmers who used to have real farms and were in danger of losing them, and the bonus marchers, all were rising up and making their feelings and demands felt, and it really did usher in a uh, new state of affairs. Franklin Roosevelt, promising to restore this country to prosperity, won a landslide victory. In private that night, as his son James helped remove his braces, FDR confessed he was afraid. All my life, the president-elect said, I have been afraid of only one thing, fire. Tonight, I think I'm afraid of something else. I'm afraid that I may not have the strength to do this job. Roosevelt's son made no reply. And then his father added, after you leave me tonight, I'm going to pray that God will give me the strength to do this job and to do it right. I hope you will pray for me too. Yes, we are, yes, we are the 99. Yes, we are, yes, we are the 99. 99, 99, 99. Look, I was skeptical at first, like I wrote a great hook, but I had no verse. I'm sitting, trying to figure what the song's about, except a bunch of flower children want to scream and shout, but yeah. There's really nothing wrong with that Got signs in the front, drums in the back Till I start to get a feeling down in my gut Always love democracy, maybe this is what it looks like Heard the phrase 99 thinking what the devil It's gotta mean more than an income level The concept that if we all shine together Might be enough sun left to change the weather or the phenomenon that what we got in common is more than what will make us start bombing And I'm hoping that Obama comes down one night, you know, just chat and chill Then goes back and tries to mic check on Capitol right. Hill mic Let's check. occupy Wall Street, occupy Oakland Hoping for a change, hope to keep your purse open People here struggling, looking up for answers This ain't for the club or for you to make a dance up Coppers try to knock us while we protest Oh yes, homeless, we hopeless, we so stressed And yet, we stretch dollars Unemployed, blue collars, we holler. 
we scholars ask for much don't need nada can't stop us picket signs we the 99 nines up these times nuts and i nuts we honor this tradition civil rights hope they listen let's bum rush through the system we need lift and watch the throne watch your own get moving and think different yes we are yes we are 99 Living in these awkward times, citizens is ostracized, regulations modified, predestined to occupy. Polar opposites, they live a life of opulence. My people are starving, they protest for the populace. Poverty stricken, the working class in this octagon. Fighting to feed eight kids like the Octomom. Move at your own pace, speeding on this Autobahn. German counterparts tell us stories about the wall. Eventually them curtains fall Encores for democracy get no applause Protest a coke fiend with bloody feet Call him Charlie Sheen Money never sleeps Told me he against Wall Street too At Gordon Gecko fed time Tiger blood and the booze Tear gas and riot gear Sexual abuse All in the name of 99% of getting We're truth We're back with civil rights We learned that separate wasn't equal Now we get the sequel Unequal also is an equal, and 1% of the people control so much of what we think and we do. Creates what you might call an imbalance, when our dreams and our talents lay around frustrated, unemployed, and unchallenged. Like a dream deferred, festering in the sun, wondering if it's all gonna amount to something. A mighty rumbling deep inside the American chest, from northeast to south, from midwest to west. Bailed out the banks, now what about the rest? It's in our communities that we should invest In our schools, in our homes, in our neighbors and kids So when people look back asking what we did Heard a call one day, went down to the park Found a revolution waiting, only needed a spark Yes we are, yes we are the 99 Yes we are, yes we are the 99 Yes we are, yes we are